You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Brad Ford. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. We've got a great show lined up for you today. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com and subscribe to the show. No matter how you listen, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Pandora, Spotify, or YouTube, you can subscribe to the show and never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today. Scribophile is a respectful online writing workshop and writer's community. Writers of all skill levels join to improve each other's work with thoughtful critiques and by sharing their writing experiences. We're the writing group to join if you want to find beta readers, get the best feedback around, learn how to get published, and be a part of the friendliest and most successful writing workshop online. Improve your writing by receiving detailed critiques. Learn from a vast collection of free writing resources. Make lifelong friends in our busy community of writers. Writing is a solitary art, but that doesn't mean you have to be lonely. Lucky for you, there are thousands of writers on Scribophile every day, and we're a really friendly bunch. You've never seen a writing group like this one. Join Scribophile today at Scribophile.community. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Business Essentials for Authors is your Business 101 guide for the publishing industry. Whether you've never published at all or are looking to take your professional career up a notch in an easy-to-read and conversational way, the book covers the five pillars of business. We look at all of this and more from a long-term strategic view. How to get the plan done and the mindset to make it all work. Business Essentials for Writers. How to Make Money in an Ever-Changing Industry by James Nettles. Both Sides of the Law, the Casper Halliday NYPD series, book one by Nathan Roden. He shared his father's dream of becoming a detective. A prison sentence was not part of his plan. Casper Halliday's dream began to unravel two months before his 16th birthday. His father, Bobby, resigned from the NYPD after 15 years without an explanation. Casper's parents fought. Sirens closed in on their home from every direction. The sound that had always been a source of comfort now brought only humiliation. Bobby Halliday moved out. Casper's dream dissolved into a daily fight for survival. All he wanted now was to finish high school so he could ease his mother's burden. On his 17th birthday, in the throes of depression, Casper made a bad decision. That decision brought him face to face with one of the most dangerous men in the city. In Casper's world, there is laughter and there are tears. There's light and there's bitter darkness. There are improbable friends and unspeakable enemies. The Casper Halliday NYPD series launches with the most unlikely of beginnings. Read both sides of the law today. The ebook edition includes a sneak peek of Ghost Man, book two in the series. For the Words is a unique writing motivator unlike anything I've seen. For the Words is an online writing platform which motivates writers of all backgrounds to increase their word count through gamification. Writing can be challenging, especially when you need to consistently produce a high output of words. By injecting a little fun into the routine and using daily rewards to promote a healthy writing habit, For the Words makes it easier to reach that word count. We're a community of bloggers, professional authors, college and high school students, research scientists, gamers, and first-time writers from all over the world. Come for the words, stay for the fun. Go to 4, that's the number 4, thewords.com. Writers, the internet is one of the best tools for research and creativity. It can also be one of the biggest hindrances to productivity, distracting you from doing the the seat-in-the-chair, hand-on-keyboard work. Rescue Time gives you an accurate picture of how you spend your time to help you become more productive every single day. Spot inefficiencies in your day and become better at managing your time. Create a goal like spending less than one hour per day on email to help you stay focused. Set an alarm to tell you when you spent more than two hours on Facebook. Try Rescue Time and use our special discount code for 30% off 
a Rescue Time premium account by going to rescuetime.com slash author stories. Let us help you rescue your time. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am really excited to have Brad Thor back on the show with us today, talking about his brand new book, Backlash. Uh, guys, I got this book uh, just a few days ago, and it uh, I have torn through it. It is it is absolutely amazing. Brad, I don't know how you do it, uh, but you know, you told me the last time you were on the show that each year between books, you work on the craft, and you try to be a better writer each year. And every time I say, well, this is this is the top of Brad's game, but it wasn't because Backlash is your best yet. Uh, <laughs> welcome back to the show. Well, it's a pleasure to be back. And that's a lovely introduction. So thank you for those compliments. I, I appreciate it because the books never get easier to write. <laughs> uh, I am uh, I am trying to raise the bar each time, which uh, makes it harder on me. But. I'm not what matters. It's the reader that matters. And as you and I have discussed before, those are the people I work for. So That's I'm right. going to give them everything I'm capable of. That's right. Um, so much that I want to ask you uh, from when we talked last time. Um, first off, let, let's touch on the new book for just a minute. Backlash. And we'll, we'll come back to it and get into detail in a little bit. But what's the? where does Scott find himself in this new book? So to give you a 30,000-foot view, Scott Harvath, my protagonist, and I, I use the example of uh, – and this is not a close ex comparison, but imagine an American James Bond where if the new James Bond movie is out, it doesn't matter if you've seen the 24 episodes before. You can jump right in and have a great ride, and that's the way I do my, my books with, with Scott Harvath. You can jump in at any point. You don't have to read them all. You're, you're good to go with Backlash if that's your first book with me. 30,000-foot um, view on this is Harvath has caused a lot of trouble for one foreign hostile power in particular, and they decide, you know what? Enough of this guy screwing up our plans. We are gonna, we're going to risk everything, snatch him on American soil, bring them to one of our black sites, meaning this hostile foreign power's got a black site, and we're going to interrogate him, and once we're done, we're going to put a bullet in his head. So they successfully pulled this off, which I've never had him taken prisoner before. He's an apex predator. Nobody gets the better of him, but in this book, these guys spill buckets of blood to get him, put a bag over his head, and drag him to this foreign country. They switch planes in this country, and the plane he's put on that's supposed to take him the final leg of the journey to the black site uh, has mechanical issues and goes down. Harvath knows he's going to get one chance to escape, and he puts in all of his what, what's known as SEER training that the military and intelligence operatives get. It's an acronym for Survive, Evade, Resist, Escape. He has to put all of his training, everything he's ever learned about escaping from a hostile enemy into effect to get out. And only then can he start thinking about getting revenge for the circumstances under which he was grabbed and what happened during that. Um, you've talked about uh, Scott Harvath as being an apex predator before, and he's the guy that's just uh, he, he's going to come through. Um, what did it do for you as the writer when you're when you're building a character like this? And 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 in each book, you you um you know, are able to keep building on his character and we learn more about him and we, we love him even more and we root for him even more, but having that moment of vulnerability and, and, you know, for, uh, you know, for the rest of us, um, it, you know, seeing him, uh, get bettered one time, get bested one time. Um, I, what, what does giving him uh, a situation like that, what does that offer you as the writer? To, to have that one little crack of vulnerability, even if it was well-earned uh, by the other side. Well, I, I have to tell you, that's a key component that made this book incredibly hard for me to write because he was dealing, the protagonist, Scott Harvath, was dealing with issues that I personally have not dealt with. I've always said he's my alter ego the same way I'm sure Jack Ryan was for Clancy and uh, James Bond was for Ian Fleming. Scott Harvath is my alter ego. He gets to do things I joke that my wife won't let me go and do. You know, I'm not allowed to seduce Russian women, none of that stuff. There's a there's a bright line in our house of where my uh, my quote unquote, air quotes research ends uh, doesn't go past that point. So it was tough. And one of the hardest things was is 
I know guys that do what my fictional character does. They do it in the real world. Uh, and I know some of them who have dealt with personal issues while they're downrange. And they've explained to me how they have to compartmentalize everything, to just put things in a locked iron box and not think about them so that they can succeed with their mission. But there was so much that Scott Harvath uh, that went into the whole – him getting grabbed and there's moments of absolute weakness for him in this. You don't know if he's going to pull through where he has to have a little introspection. He has to be thinking about these things. And for me, not having dealt with what he was dealing with, I didn't know where the correct balance was. What's too much? What's not enough? What are my readers going to think? Are they going to think there's no way anybody would not think about this stuff or there's no way anybody would dwell that much on it? So to find kind of the the Goldilocks, the, the bowl of porridge that was just the right temperature was really, really tough because I haven't – for this particular adventure of Harvest, I have not gone through this stuff. Uh, so I didn't have any kind of personal experience that I could draw from to base his reactions on and how that goes into his calculus. So it took a lot of extra research and a lot of this stuff, you know, losing people on your team and things like that is, is really rough stuff to get anybody to talk about who's ever been there. And it's it's pretty interesting stuff. But I, I think based on what I've heard from folks like you and early reviewers, they seem to think that the tone was perfect, that it was done just right, that that I nailed it. And it, it that, that's the big thing that you have to do when you write a series character is you have to reveal a little bit more of them with each book. That's that's where the character's development comes from. You, he doesn't have to change because we want James Bond and Indiana Jones to be exactly the same at the end of, of the film that than they were at the beginning. We don't want that to change. But for a series character, you need to write for two groups of readers. You need to write for your longtime readers who know everything about your character. They've been on every adventure with you. And you also have to write for the brand new reader who know nothing about them. And that's a real tightrope of how you keep both groups happy, informed, and most importantly, entertained. Um, Stan Lee one time said, uh, talking about how he uh... – approached his writers for comic books and and he told them that every book that you write is someone's first comic book and i i always like that idea that uh especially if you're writing a series to keep it accessible um because you don't know where someone's going to come in and uh you know when they see backlash uh in the airport and they're you know looking for that read to take you know uh, on on their summer trip with them that may be their first uh you know uh it the first time that they meet Scott Harvath. Um, how do you do that, um, knowing that you have so much um, baggage is not the right word, so much history with this character? Um, how do you keep him accessible um, so that we feel like this is a mature character, yet uh, we're able to come right into the story and not get lost? It's a challenge. Uh, one of the things that my editors always said is, I want your books to stand alone. I don't want somebody to come into the bookstore and say, wow, Thor's written how many books? Well, I can't start here. I have to start at the beginning. And then if they don't have book number one, those folks go and buy somebody else's book. You don't want to cannibalize your own sales. So it, it's it's tough because even with this book, I jumped into it and I started writing and everything. And my editor read the first draft and she said, OK, it's a great job. But in the beginning of the book, I need to know a little bit more about Harvath if I'm a first time reader. So even my editor was was really aware of that and sensitive to it to make sure that we had enough just to give people a footing for who Harvath is. Uh, you know, you I find different ways. I never do a cut and paste from previous books, but I always want people to know he's kind of been through a different a, a couple of different career changes. Uh, and to basically give a condensed version of his resume so people understand his skill set and what his training has been like. Uh, it, but again, you got to find a fresh way to do this every single book because like Stan Lee said, this is going to be somebody's first book. So it, that's, that's a big part of the craft and doing that so that you make those first time readers happy and you don't bore the long time readers. Uh, because Elmore Leonard was famous for saying, to young younger writers, leave out the parts that people skip. But that applies to older, more seasoned writers as well. You don't want anybody to, to glaze over. You want every word to count. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I was talking with Mike Madden yesterday, who took over the Jack Ryan Jr. Uh, series, uh, you know, after um, 
Tom Clancy uh, passed away, and uh, we were talking about the the idea of, of the old Clancy books and these these big set pieces. Um, uh, you know, it was, it, it was really easy to know who uh, which sides were which. Uh, and then you know when the when the Soviet Union fell, and we get into the nineties, and then the the uh, the aughts. Uh, you know, a lot of thrillers and, and those plots changed because the world changed. And uh, now we're coming back to um, a lot of books that that uh, we're getting back to some of these big set pieces again. Um, how do you see the, the thriller landscape and what's going on in the real world affecting the way we can tell stories? Well, it's it's interesting for me. I'm being careful to not set a lot in the White House. Um, there used to be a lot of uh, presidential scenes in previous books of mine, and it is tough. People are reading too much into things. Even if I give create a fictional uh, character that works in the White House, particularly if it's the president, you get people that start wondering: Is this supposed to be a comment on? the current administration, and it's not with me. I, I'm, I want to entertain people. I'm not here to make political statements or anything like that. So I found that I just have made a conscious decision to avoid the White House. There's a little bit in this book. I put it in when I think it's necessary, but I really haven't done presidential uh, through lines for, for a little bit in the plots, and it's worked fine. There's plenty to do with D.C. and politics without – having half the book set in the White House. The more I can keep it in the field with action, uh, with a couple chapters, meanwhile, back on the farm, uh, what's going on at CIA headquarters or wherever, the better. I think the books move. I, I've noticed that with my books. I've kind of call it, I, I used to do like five storylines and tie them all up in the be- at the end, and now I'm down to like three. And I think the books move even faster. And I love when people say to me, gosh, you know, I just couldn't put it down. These short, crisp, cinematic chapters and uh, just you kept me up all night. That's great. Uh, as is when people say to me, you know, I gave your book to my dad or I gave it to my son or my mom or or my aunt. They were never readers before. They just didn't like reading. But boy, I gave them your book and now they're reading all your books. They just love your writing style. It's so easy. It's so much fun. I'm an entertainer. That's that's what I'm in the job to do is to give you the best white knuckle thrill ride I'm capable of. So I'm constantly looking for big ideas, but plausible ideas, things, things that I think are coming down the pike, things that I want you to feel like my books could happen on your doorstep this afternoon or tonight or tomorrow morning. I want them to be that real and that pressing, but I also want them to stand the test of time. I want you to pick up a book of mine five years from now and still find it gripping, regardless of what's happening in the world, and I want it to still be plausible in the future. Right. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you know people that do the kind of work uh, and, and get into the situations that Scott Harvath gets himself into. Um, I remember the last time we talked, we were talking about the Lions of Lucerne. And when that book was published, that you had some fans and, and some people that uh, offered to help you um, with uh, especially firearms knowledge. I, I remember yep. us talking specifically about that. Um how is that like now? Um, you, you talked about knowing people that that are in the situation. Does does writing these kinds of books open you up to uh, to meeting the people that that do this sort of thing? And and how much do you depend on um, those professionals to get information and and to make sure that you tell their stories correctly? Well, it's a big deal. I, I call what I do faction. Uh, it was Glenn Beck that coined that. Uh, so I say with my books, you don't know where the facts end and the fiction begins. And for that to work, I have to get the details right. Um, I've read a lot of Stephen King books that I really enjoy, and I'm not for a second going to pretend that I know how hard or how easy Stephen King's job is. But I do know he gets to make up a lot of his own rules, right? So if you're writing about monsters or demons, whatever, there is no – that's not reality. Um, so you have a, I, I would imagine he has a certain degree of latitude greater than mine. So I am, I, I have, I'm in a box. Uh, if I'm writing about uh, DevGrew, which used to be SEAL Team 6 or Delta Force, uh, if I'm writing about those guys, I have to get that stuff correct. My jargon has to be spot on, the weapons, the tactics, 
all that kind of stuff has to be true because those guys read my books and I want them to say, you know what? Good job, Thor, because they'll let me know if I screw up and I don't want that. So uh, having access to those experts in being able to pick their brains and things like that is, is really, really important to me. And um, I also I had a meeting years ago in Hollywood with Mouse McCoy, who directed uh, the the movie where they incorporated real life Navy SEALs act of valor. And Mouse and I were talking and Mouse said, you know, Brad, we really are caretakers for their brand. Uh, we're not SEALs, but we're writing about them. And it's important that we, we showcase them in the best light possible. And we do nothing to tarnish that brand. We do everything we can to help elevate that brand. So when I get letters from young men and women that say they decided to join the military because of reading my books, that that was an on-ramp for them, that's quite flattering. Absolutely. Um, the how do you see the the state of of Russia uh, today on on the world stage? And uh, it's a it's a different place from when the Soviet Union uh, was in power. Yet we're seeing a lot of these same types of um, patterns uh, happening again. Um, as a fiction writer, how do you start looking at what's going on and try to speculate? as to um, what things might happen and, and how do book plots start coming out of those things? Well, it's interesting because, uh, you know, uh, the only people I can talk to are people on our side that have worked against the Russians. Right. Um, so uh, whether it's intelligence operatives that have had to do things in, in Russia, whether it's diplomats that have had to do negotiations with the Russians, I, I, I get a very one-sided view of things because the Russians aren't going to cooperate with me. So I read a ton about them. I, I, I particularly am interested in what dissidents say about life in Russia, things like this. Um, listen, it's a bunch of ex-KGB people. It's a kleptocracy over there. It, it's it's a handful of people that are just absolutely pillaging that country and getting hyper wealthy from it. And um, Russia is Russia is is a is a foe that we need to take very seriously. They are they are uh, dead set on breaking up NATO and uh, and blunting the United States uh, influence in the world. So I, there's a lot of bad people. There's a lot of good people that live in that country, but there's a lot of bad actors that run the country. And so it's not far off things we were seeing during the Cold War. It's just. Uh, it's just the the suits are nicer. They're actually not using wearing Russian suits. They're actually getting tailored by you know expensive Savile Row tailors and in, in Italian brands. And uh, so the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, it's just meet the new boss, same as the old boss. <laughs> right. Um, you mentioned earlier that your books um, you like to make stories that feel like they could happen just just any time. It could happen to us tomorrow. Um, that's a fine line uh, of balancing um, th probabilities and things that could be with uh, with completely missing the mark and and dealing with um, with situations and and players that may not even exist. You know, a year from uh, from now or so. Um, do you ever worry about uh, one of your stories becoming dated and becoming uh, completely implausible for someone who comes around later uh, because of the way the world works and the way it changes? Um, I can't think of one of your books that, that that has happened to. But is that ever something that you think about? It's something I, I make sure I don't do. So, for instance, I never wrote about bin Laden because I knew at some point they were going to catch him or kill him. So right. there was no way I was going to put bin Laden in one of my books. Uh, the the big bad terrorist that was number one on the hit list before bin Laden was a guy named Abu Nidal. Um, and so my second book had to do with Abu Nidal, but not Abu Nidal actually had to do with uh, – I fictionalized that he, that he uh, groomed his two children, a son and a daughter, to take over the terrorist organization. And that's how I got in to talk about his terrorist organization without hanging the plot on him. And while I was writing the book, in my book, he was dead. Uh, he actually did turn up dead in Iraq while I was writing it. Uh, the Iraqis claimed that he had committed suicide by shooting himself in the head multiple times. Like you do. Yeah, like you do. It's, it's <laughs> never one shot that ends, that ends it. It's, it's multiple times you got to pull the trigger. 
So that's an example of how I knew at some point Abu Nidal was going to surface. I wanted to deal with this terrorist organization. And I said, okay, let's just assume he's already dead or that he's already handed the reins over because he's never going to argue with that. And you're never going to see a news report that says he's still running the. There's a way to get into these items. Like last summer's book, Spymaster, was about we have the Article 5 agreement in the NATO treaty that an attack on one member in NATO is an attack on all members in NATO. And I said, okay, we're having some interesting discussions about NATO here in the United States. The Russians hate NATO, they'd like to see it broken up. And I said to myself, okay, how about a president? who doesn't like NATO very much and doesn't want to get dragged in, you know, to a war because the Russians invaded, you know, a country like Latvia that many Americans couldn't even point to on a map. So what might a president do? Well, I thought about it and I thought, what about a president that's willing to release a guy like Scott Harvath, take off the chain and say, here you go, whatever you need, get over there and make sure war doesn't break out because we don't want to have to come to the aid of Poland or Germany or whatever. And you go stop this war from happening. That's great. That's going to resonate with people 10, 15, 20 years from now. That'll be evergreen. So it's it's how you choose to access. It's it's almost like it's a it's a like a basketball. And you can come at it from any angle, but you you have to be careful because if you come at it from the most obvious angle, you can date yourself very quickly. And, you know, these books can stay out there for a really long time and fans can enjoy them for decades. Why wouldn't you do everything you could to keep them evergreen? And that's my goal. Exactly. Exactly. Um, when when we first talked, we talked about uh, when you were a kid reading Hardy Boys and how those books really um, opened your uh, your mind to the the world of thrillers and mysteries, and um, it, it really instilled this love of of reading and, and story in you. Um, when you are at the place where you are now, and and we can we, we talk a lot about you know the. Um, the the things that inspire thrillers and and you know world events and things like that um but what do you do to protect your creative side uh and and how do you feed yourself creatively so that not only can you tell a great thriller story and and the technology is right and and all of that stuff but how do you feed yourself so that you uh are are still creating good stories and you're connecting with characters well, so first of all, um, Louis L'Amour, uh, the great Western writer, always had a paperback in his back pocket. So if he was standing in line at the post office, he had something to read, standing in line at the grocery store, something to read, waiting at the train station to pick something up, somebody up. He always had something to read. So I'm a voracious reader. And it's funny you should mention Mike because I was just on vacation in Key West and I took one of Mike's Clancy books that I haven't read with me. Mike's a great author. And yes, so, uh, you know, and I haven't met Mike yet. Uh, I think we're both residents of the great state of Tennessee. Um, and I have not crossed paths with him, but I took one of Mike's, uh, I think it was Point of Contact, one of his last two books, paperback. And uh, I was going down to Key West. And I was going to see Hemingway's house. And I have never read To Have and Have Not, which is a mm. really cool book. Uh, yeah. about a guy that kind of gets forced into smuggling and uh, and I took that and that was fun and then it, it, when you're an author when you're a published author you have no shortage of books to read because everybody wants a blurb so I've got a stack of stuff that my editor has sent me and there was another great ARC of a book that I think is coming out at the end of the summer called Deep State, which is a political thriller. It's not it's not a political book per se. You hear that term used a lot right now, the deep state and all that kind of stuff. This is just a it was just a a, a hooky cool title for a great thriller. And so I took that with me. So I try to read a lot and then um there is some television that I really love for the writing. And one of the shows that just gets my creative spark going, uh, because I never know what's going to happen next, is the Ray Donovan series on Showtime with uh, Lee Schreiber. I, I, <laughs> what a great series. It's fantastic. I mean, here's a guy who, by all accounts, is a pretty bad dude. Uh, but you still, it's, he's, it's still a family drama and this guy gets kicked around like nobody's business and things don't go his way. Um, so I, I, I'm a big reader and I don't like 
television cutting into my reading time. It's really important that I protect that time and I don't want to get sucked into binging everything on Netflix and I don't. So I'm very particular about what I watch. Uh, we're watching the Chernobyl thing right now with the kids, which has just ended and, and we're catching up because they're now out of school and they can watch it with us. But I really seek out fabulous, fabulous writing because great writing is great writing no matter where you see it and you can learn from it. And that's my goal. Like I said, getting better between each book uh, is watching other great writers work. Well, speaking of, of that, um, I know that you've had some things in the works uh, for a while with uh, uh, Scott Harvath on, on the big screen. Um, if you could choose right now between a Scott Harvath movie with uh, with the director that you would want and uh, the casting that you would want or a television series, which one would you choose? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if you saw the six episode series that was done on Le Carre's book, The Night Manager with Tom Hiddleston. That was such a great adaptation of that book. Uh, as an author, as an artist, as a purist, I know you can turn each one of my books into a season of television and nail it all. If you're going to make a movie, you're going to have to trim a lot out of my yeah. books. It's a uh, lot of compromises in movie. It's a lot of compromises. So my goal would be a hybrid deal would be to get a, you know, I want my cake and I want to eat it too. So I want a, I want a full feature length movie and then I want to do episodic television as well, which is actually what we're looking at right now uh, in Hollywood, trying to put that deal together. And we're getting very, knock on wood, we're getting very close. Um, but it, it's hard to say because it's the golden age of television right now. And I look at, you look at the success of Game of Thrones, George R. R. Martin, eight seasons they did. And everybody saw it. Um, would everybody have wanted eight Game of Thrones movies? I don't think you would have gotten eight movies out of that. But you did get eight series, of, uh, eight seasons of television. So um, I'm trying to figure. I'm trying to do that math. I'm trying to figure out which is which. Which is going to satisfy my readers the most and is going to earn me new readers, right? Because that's really why I'd want a TV series or a film to be done. Um, if you could have something as successful as the Bond uh, franchise, then movies are the way to go. I mean that's really exciting and, uh, and they can be real um, – uh, real cultural touch points. I mean, Bond's iconic. If I could do something with all the people I want to work with in Hollywood and, and get a film at the level of a Bond movie, then film is unquestionably the way I'd want to go. If I could get everybody, yeah, that's what I'd want to do. Yeah, it's a different thing, though. If you look at those Ian Fleming novels, those Bond novels, they were they were pretty thin, yep. and you, you generally have, have one plot going through with, with a couple little side things, but it's generally one... One main story, as opposed to a Scott Harvath novel, that that really needs to be television, I think. I, anyway, I, I think to fully capture what I put into each of the novels, I think television is the way is definitely the way to go. And I mean, we're looking at so right now, Backlash is my 19th novel. The 25th Bond is shooting as you and I are recording this. And I mean, so, but it's taken them from the 1960s uh, to now to get 25 done. And I've got 19. So, you know, that's a, that's a long, long time with a lot of different actors playing Bond and everything. So right now it's the golden age of television in Hollywood. Um, and people are binging and they really like that stuff. So um, it, to most accurately unpack my books, TV is, TV is the way to go. No question. Uh, with all the stuff that you're doing, and, and I know you're on a, a book a year publishing schedule, and, uh, and and you've said that when you finish a book, uh, that you spend time uh, becoming a better writer, doing things that that help you with the craft. Uh, what kinds of things do you do uh, to to work those muscles and to to continue to learn even after you know 19 novels? And I'm assuming you're you're probably well into the 20th novel now. Yeah, I've just started the 20th, um, which makes my wife very happy because she complains I don't start them early enough. And then I, you know, my weeks bleed into the weekends and over <laughs> Christmas vacation with the kids, we don't go anywhere because I'm nailed to my desk. Um, 
I try to read books about the craft of writing. And I've, so I will look at what's out there now, what's been, uh, what people have loved in the past. And I look at screenwriting books too, because the, the art of storytelling is the art of storytelling. And I've got, um, there's one book that I picked up, uh, a screenwriter friend recommended it called Save the Cat. And uh, it had a great opening uh, suggestion or rule for authors that you really need to show your protagonist as being likable. And he used, for example, I don't know if you remember the movie Sea of Love with Al Pacino and Ellen Barkin. And Al Pacino, that movie opens with a sting where uh, the NYPD is trying to get parole violators, people that have not showed up at court and all this kind of stuff. They send them letters welcoming them to this big hotel ballroom on a Saturday saying, you've won like Yankees tickets and come on in. We want to do a ceremony and congratulate you. And uh, so Pacino's standing in the hall. They've got all these bad ex-cons inside. and They're getting ready to arrest them all. And a guy shows up late. And he's a parole violator or whatever, but he shows up with his kid and the kid's got a Yankees hat on and a baseball glove. And I mean, this is wow. Pacino could bust the guy right there or he could let the guy go into the ballroom and he, his kid could see all these people arrested en masse inside this ballroom. But Pacino, without letting the kid see, shows the old man his badge. And the old man kind of stops and looks and is petrified. You know, am I going to get busted right here in front of my little boy? He thought we were coming here for baseball. And Pacino looks at the father and says, catch you later. It's such a great opening. You know, it's, you right away like that character. And that's probably one of the biggest lessons that I learned going into writing the current book, Backlash, is what do I do to – immediately set Scott Harvath up as likable. And I found an opportunity for him to give assistance to somebody he didn't need to help. Uh, somebody that he could have looked the other way and let something bad happen to this person. But instead, he's going to help this person even though he doesn't need to. So you know that it isn't, you know, I'm going to I'm going to escape at all costs, no matter how many lives I've got to extinguish on the way out. To it, All that matters is my freedom. No, this guy still has a code you know, I've had people call Harvath the ultimate Boy Scout and things like this, but he's a human being, and he, he, even though he's got to go out and do some incredibly dangerous and sometimes vicious things, he still has that spark of humanity inside him. That has not been snuffed out, and that's the constant battle for him is not allowing it to be snuffed out because he doesn't want to go to that place that exists once the spark is gone. It's a very dark, very bad place, and so he fights hard not to get dragged in there. And as much as we love the gunfights and the explosions and, you know, all of that stuff, what we really connect with is, uh, is Scott's humanity. And, uh, and you keep bringing that around for us each and every time we love to see a man struggle to do the right thing and to, uh, to, to cling to his humanity. And that's exactly what it is. And it's funny, prior to writing this book, I'd read an interesting old, years old review in the New York Times of a translation, a new translation of the Odyssey. And I ended up buying it and I, I used it for the epigraph in the beginning of the book. Um, and what was interesting is this article talked about that soldiers leaving for war should read the Iliad because it'll let them know what they have to leave behind before they set foot on the battlefield. But soldiers returning home from war should read the Odyssey because it will tell them what they need to then leave on the battlefield before they set foot on the soil of home. And I I thought that was really interesting. So I dove into the Odyssey a little bit, uh, and I was looking for parallels kind of between uh, Odysseus and Ray Donovan. You know, you think you're on the right track. You think you're almost home, and suddenly this ill, will, uh, this Ill wind blows you off course, or this happens, or that happens. And I wanted to c kind of draw some subtle parallels between the journey Scott Harvass taking in Backlash and what, uh, what Odysseus went through in the Odyssey. Excellent. Uh, Brad, I've never gotten to ask uh, a guest this, so um, will I be able to put a uh, Brad Thor 2020 sign in my yard uh, <laughs> next year? No, I got to tell you, uh, <laughs> but what you can do is I'm inventing an app that doesn't let you tweet after the second bourbon or after 10 <laughs> o'clock at night. I'll let you have a free, I'll let you be a beta tester of that app. My wife can't wait for me to unroll that. 
so uh, you can be a beta tester on that one. Now, I, I was, ex you know, I'm very happy. It's been a year. I haven't made any political headlines since April of 2018. I'm sure my publisher is even happier than my wife is. Um, you know, I was really frustrated that uh, the party I used to belong to claimed to be the party of fiscal responsibility and told me once they had control of the House, the Senate, and the Oval Office that they would cut deficits, cut the debt. Uh, they would think of our children's future. They would stop spending uh, so much money. And that just wasn't the case. And when I made that announcement saying, you know, I wanted to get into the primaries so I could you know, bring up the issues that were important to me, fiscal responsibility was number one. Uh, we don't own this country. You and I are stewards of this republic, and it's our job to hand a freer, more successful, more secure, more prosperous nation on to the next generation that was given to us. And we don't do that if we're running the spending through the roof. And listen, I like tax cuts. I'm a small business guy. I like keeping as much of my money as possible. You can't give the country tax cuts and <laughs> increase your spending at the same time. You have to the, – the way to do this is to – if you want to spur the economy with tax cuts, that's great, but then you gotta, you got to get your spending under control as well. You can't increase spending and cut revenue coming in. It's just – if you and I ran our households the way Washington runs the federal <laughs> government, we'd be out on the street, but yeah. we don't have printing presses. They do. That's right. They can print well, and, money. We can't. Well, it's each of our job to, to use our voices where we can and to, to – uh... To just try to bring some common sense to the conversation. You know what? I was just reading uh, Federalist uh, papers. I was reading nine and particularly ten by by Madison. And what that's one of the things that Madison talked about was that it's the job. We actually do need a quote unquote political class. They have to be responsible, but their number one job is to explain to everybody else how the mechanisms of government work so that the voters understand why things are done. And you also need a, a seasoned, experienced group of politicians so that they can take the wishes and the will of the people and then say, OK, how does this measure up against what's good for the republic as a whole? So Madison was saying that people who understand politics should speak up about politics and try to educate their friends and neighbors and things like this. So it's an important role that those of us who, who care about the republic and understand its workings, that we do speak up and we try to educate our fellow Americans. Americans, uh, so that they can make better choices, so that they can understand uh, how how government works and why it's important that we all be educated. And unfortunately, people kind of phone it in these days. There's there's not the civic interaction that we used to have. Um, we're not as well plugged into how the country works and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but anyway, so the, that's the long answer. No, you don't get a Brad Thor for President 2020 bumper sticker. I'm sorry, not going to happen. Well. Well, well put, uh, anyway. Uh, Brad, the new book, Backlash, is out today. When folks are hearing this, they can go pick up their copy. It's available in hardback, uh, Kindle edition, audiobook, any way that you love to connect with Scott Harvath, you can today. Uh, Brad, thank you so much uh, for the book and uh, for, for doing what you do. Uh, lots of us out here appreciate it, and thank you so much for being so generous with your time and coming back on the show today. It's always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. On Walpurgis night, when the moon is high, hell's bells ring and witches must answer. They dapple their breasts with rendered fat of murdered babes, straddle their brooms and take to the sky, as the devil wills, to speed through dreamy midnight air to the summit of the Brockenberg, that haunted peak shrouded in swirling mists, where a glen of gnarled limbs and wan moonlight awaits to host their debauches and blasphemies. Now to the brock and the witches ride. The stubble is gold and the corn is green. There shall the carnival sabbat be seen, and the devil shall come to preside. The accuser elopes from the bowels of hell, a sure-footed, goat-headed, many-horned beast with cloven hooves and a staff of bone. He perches upon the witch altar to brood in cerulean half-light, a winged silhouette with watchful red eyes. The witches gather and bow to their master, upon his charred rump give the shameful kiss, then imps beat the drum and a round dance begins.
Lash yourselves into frenzy, hags. Pass the chalice of pure marrow broth. Whip the ground with your hair. Tread the sky with your feet. Dance with joined hands around Satan's cold fire. Then find out a nook of nettles and moss, and lay with the rough-skinned beast of your choosing, suckling some rancid teat of desire. But hist! The cock crows. Away, away! Gather your tatters and broomsticks and wits, back to your huts, to your thresholds and hearths, and become once more, at the red break of day, the furtive adder in your neighbor's garden. The ghost host of the Salem Sorcery Tour Dazzling in his steampunk Victorian morning crepe, let the spell he'd woven trail through the twilight air like a hag across the moon, then chirped, Isn't that silly? and bowed, sweeping the wet grass with his satin-ribboned top hat. The tour group gave a polite round of applause. Nobody believes that stuff today, but the Puritans sure did. They took witches very seriously. If they went down in the morning and bought eggs, and one was rotten, surely the devil had come in the night, gone boop, tee-hee-hee, then scampered off on his little hooves. And who's in league with the devil? Witches. We're taught that the Puritans were super nice and cute with little buckles on their hats, but it's not the case, folks. They were fanatics. Witch hunts don't happen in a healthy society. They hated kids. They hated women. They were crazy, and that craziness. He turned on the spot, casting a protective circle around the stone garden of the witch memorial. Got these people killed, 